Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. When I was a kid growing up, whenever we'd have any relatives or friends coming to stay with us, we'd always do a thorough cleaning of the house to be sure that when they arrived, the place looked spotless. Every time I'd probably ask my mom, why are we going through all this trouble? And every time my mom would tell me, well, this is what you do to honor your guests. Well, today we're starting Exodus 26. We're going to talk about creating a place and a people that honors the Lord. So welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. I'm Russ Brewer. Thanks for listening. It is great to have you part of this study and this topic that is so important for understanding the kind of worship that honors our Lord. Now, as we turn to Exodus 26, last time we started our discussion of the tabernacle and explained that the tabernacle is a semi-permanent, semi-portable, tent-like structure that was at the center of the Jewish system of worship for three centuries until the temple was built later on by Solomon. Now, today we're going to dig into what this building was made of and a little bit of what it probably looked like as well. But here's the thing. For being so central to the Jewish system of worship, the tabernacle itself wasn't all that big. When we think about ancient places of worship, we think of the giant temples with massive wide staircases leading to massive giant pillars opening up to massive rooms. Or even in Egypt, the the massive pyramids, which were probably around for a thousand years already by the time of Moses. And yet, the place of worship that God wanted wasn't like those man-made structures. God's design for the tabernacle was just 45 feet long by 15 feet wide by 15 feet high. Think about that. 45 feet at the length of a large bus, school buses and tour buses, and even RVs can come in 45-foot lengths. Semi-truck trailers are typically even longer than this, which means that your typical semi-trailer is longer than the tabernacle. Now that seems counterintuitive, but that's the point. True worship doesn't require some kind of massive structure that we build for God. It requires the right focus. Along these same lines, the tabernacle is not some super ornate and beautiful building. There was definitely some design elements to it, and they might seem really intricate when we're reading chapter 26. But that's just because the Lord is describing these things with words, and He's conveying what they are to build. And while He's being very specific, this structure itself its not all that ornate. And so, with that, let's go on and talk about what this structure was made of. Last time, we said it was kind of like a tent, and so with that as a general concept, we're probably thinking this was made of some kind of fabric, kind of. We're going to see that there's a lot more to it than that. The first set of instructions in chapter 26 relate to the curtains, and and these are more the kind of curtains like for your windows. They're more like wall coverings, and they make matters more confusing in terms of if we were just reading this on our own. The tabernacle didn't have just one set of these wall coverings, but four, or more precisely, three layers with one final protective covering. The first layer is in verse 1. This is the layer that only the priest would see from the inside of the tabernacle. These curtains form something of a ceiling. They were made of fine linen curtains, as in they, they weren't thick and scratchy, but light and smooth. They were blue and purple, and they had in them images, woven into them, images of cherubim, like these angelic beings. And since these curtains were then suspended from the ceiling, When a priest was inside the tabernacle, if he were to look up, he would, in a sense, see these cherubim looking down at him. And this was a constant reminder of the worship and the exaltation going on before the Lord, even now in heaven. Now, verse 2 tells us the dimensions of these curtains, and verses 3 and 4 talk about how they're all joined together. And then the next layer of coverings that's mentioned is down in verse 7. This layer was made of goat hair, and it would be similar to like a giant wool blanket. In Leviticus 9.3, goats were used in the sin offering. In Leviticus 16, two goats were used for the Day of Atonement, which literally means the Day of Covering. And so, there seems to be a connection between the covering of this goat hair blanket and the covering of our sin. Well, going on, verses 8 to 13 speaks about how all this joins together. And then verse 14 gives us a third layer made out of ram skin dyed red, and a fourth layer made out of some kind of marine animal. Now, the ram skin likely pointed to the ram's role as the substitute sacrifice in Genesis 22 when the Lord provided a ram as a substitute in place of Isaac. And the ram will also be a key part of the sacrificial system, including consecrating priests. Being dyed red pointed to the centrality and need for blood for atonement, and all of this would have just reminded the people and the priests that we need to have our sins covered. Now, verse 14 also mentions a top layer. This top layer was this massive leather tarp over the entire structure designed to keep water and the elements out. Now, if you have the NAS, verse 14 says this outer layer was made of porpoise skins. But the King James says badger skins, and the NIV says sea cows. Now, before we get too upset about endangered animals being killed for their hides, we need to remember what we talked about in our episode on Exodus 9, that there are times when we have lost what a Hebrew word means, 
And that's especially common with animals. And here's an example of this, where we don't know what kind of skin this was. While it seems likely this is some kind of marine animal, it could have simply been the heights of goats, the words used even of goats at times. So we don't know. But the point is that this outer layer formed a thick, protective, kind of like a giant raincoat over the whole tabernacle. For what it's worth, the outer layer is called the ohol, which means tent, and the inner three layers comprise the mishkan, which is the Hebrew word for tabernacle. So in a sense, the tabernacle had three layers to it with a final covering for the elements. Now there's a lot to all of this. The walls were thick and strong, but they could also be taken down, rolled up, and hauled down the road to the next location. In fact, the role of doing all this was assigned to two subsets of the tribe of Levi. Numbers 4 says the Gershonites packed up all the fabrics, curtains, coverings, furnishings, things like that, and the Merorites transported the building structural parts, the, the, the wood boards, the bars, the pillars, all of that stuff. And so this whole structure was designed for stability in the elements, but also mobility to keep on moving and following the Lord. Well, going on to the tabernacle structure, the walls of the tabernacle are described in verses 15 to 30. The walls were made of acacia wood planks, and acacia wood was known for its strength and resistance to decay. The wooden frame was comprised of 48 planks. Each was 15 feet high and 17 inches wide, and verse 29 says that each board was overlaid with gold. They were fitted together into a wooden support system, and verses 17 and 19 explain that the boards were to have tenons on the bottom that would fit into sockets. Now, what's a tenon? If you don't know, don't feel bad. I had to look it up too. If you Google what a tenon is, you'll instantly recognize them. They're basically pegs that stick out of the bottom of these boards, and then those pegs sink into holes in a base so that the boards can stand upright. Beds and dressers and cabinets would often have things like this, and so all you woodworkers probably knew that, but I didn't. But still, the point is that the walls weren't sunk into the ground or into the dirt. Rather, they were sunk into a base that would sit upon the dirt or upon the ground. And the boards would then lock together with this intricate system to keep them from rubbing against each other, standing upright, solid in the face of the elements. Now, this wooden framework was made in such a way as to create two rooms with a veil separating them, kind of like a giant thick room divider that you might see in a high school gym. And this veil was a major part of the tabernacle, and it's explained in verses 31 to 37. The veil was woven with blue, purple, and scarlet thread, creating images of cherubim, again, those angel-like beings. This veil hung from four pillars on the inside of the tabernacle. These pillars were overlaid with gold, and, and together with the veil, they separated the tabernacle into two rooms. One room is called the Holy Place, and the other room is called the Holy of Holies. Let's talk about the Holy Place first. The Holy Place is the larger of the two rooms. It was 30 feet long. Now, on the one hand, that's a decent-sized room, but then again, it's not really that big. Plenty of church classrooms are larger than 30 feet, and, and 30 feet is the same distance as 10 yards on a football field. Plus, this room is only 15 feet wide, so it's not a real big room, and yet it's still the bigger of the two rooms. The holy place had only three things in it. First, on the left, there was the lampstand we talked about last time. Second, on the right, there was a table with the showbread that we also talked about last time. And third, as you would walk in, in front of you, there was a small square hibachi-like grill where they would burn incense. That's explained in further detail in Exodus 30. And so this room was accessible to the priests throughout the year. But only once a year would anyone ever go into the next room, the Holy of Holies, and that was the high priest, and he would only go in once a year. And the Holy of Holies was nearly empty except for the Ark of the Covenant that we discussed last time. Now, let's talk about the dimensions of this room, this holiest of holies here. Since the entire tabernacle was only 45 feet long and 30 feet was used for the first room, that left just 15 feet by 15 feet for this second room here. And that means that the holiest of holies was 15 feet wide by 15 feet long by 15 feet tall. Now, some people think that the roof was sloped or pitched, but it would have to be flat because the width of the coverings wouldn't go all the way down the sides if there was a pitch or a slope to the roof. And so the roof was flat. And if the holiest of holies was 15 feet wide by 15 feet long and 15 feet tall, that means this room, the holiest of holies, was a cube. And that's not just a neat piece of trivia. There are only three cubes mentioned in the Bible. The holiest of holies in the tabernacle, the holiest of holies in the temple, and the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21. And so it seems pretty likely that the holiest of holies is modeled after the heavenly new Jerusalem that we will reside in for all of eternity. And that's just an exciting, mind-blowing piece of information there, something to look forward to. All right, that's chapter 26, and that's a quick run-through of the tabernacle structure. What are some takeaways of all these details? Well, for one thing, despite all these details, 
it's very clear that worship doesn't have to be particularly ornate or extravagant. And this ties into why the altar was just dirt and uncut stone, or, or the small size of the tabernacle, or the simplicity of making bread as worship. Worship is not about all the great things we do for God but it's about us celebrating what He has done for us and just giving Him gratitude and thanks. Around this world, people build huge edifices for their religious purposes. Massive temples, massive churches, massive cathedrals. But the true tabernacle, the one designed by God Himself, was simple and basic because true worship doesn't need all that fanfare. It shouldn't take much for us to contemplate our own sin or to be amazed at God's mercy and forgiveness or to look forward to eternity with Him in a realm without sin. In fact, it's possible that our beautiful and ornate buildings might actually distract us from celebrating the Lord. If it takes beauty and quietness and serenity for us to worship God, we probably don't understand what true worship is. True worship is not about how we feel. It's, it's about worshiping God in our spirit according to His truth. It's about understanding God's holiness and our sinfulness and His grace and mercy and what He has done to redeem us for Himself and how He has given His own Son to be the sacrifice to save us from our sins. And we can meditate on those truths and give God's praise no matter where we are or what's around us. We can always worship God in the beauty and the simplicity of these truths. And you know what? The tabernacle also shows us the holiness of God and our separation from Him. This whole structure is about separation. The perimeter fence was to keep the people on the outside from seeing in. The thick walls were for separation. The veil was to separate even the priests from the ark. God was not approachable because of our sin. And this underscores the unpopular truth that we cannot come to God without repentance and a sacrifice. For the Jews back then, they would repent and then bring an animal to offer. And yet there was still separation. Only the high priest went to the holiest of holies, and that only once a year. And so even with the offering, they were still separated from God. And yet, when Jesus died on the cross, Matthew 27, 51 says that the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. Now, it was torn from top to bottom to show that it was by the hand of God and not man. God himself has thrown open the access to himself so that we can come to him freely. There is now no separation between God and his people. And we have full access to God, and therefore we can approach Him boldly, not with arrogance, but with joyful fellowship, knowing that God welcomes us, and He hears us, and He desires to be with us, and He has made that way possible. He invites us to Himself to worship Him and to know Him. And so with that, let us come to the Lord daily. Let us worship Him rightly, and let us truly honor Him, worshiping Him in our spirit according to His truth. Well, thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day. Until tomorrow, God bless.